Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. The title of today's episode is United Nations Stockholm Plus 50, Only One Earth, the Earth Summit Anniversary Demands Action. And today we'll be looking at the International Court of Justice Climate Action Campaign going forward. And coincidentally, it's on the 35th anniversary of the adoption of New Zealand's nuclear weapon free law. It's exciting as we talk about the UN Stockholm Plus 50 that convened all states and civil society protect our planet. Because it's been 50 years since that historic 1972 UN conference on the human environment, which made the environment for the first time a pressing global issue in world affairs. I'd like to introduce our guest and begin with Emily. Emily, thank you so much for joining us and share your first impressions about Stockholm Plus 50 and the importance of the work you do daily. Thank you very much for inviting me. Hello from Normandy, from France. We just commemorated the D-Day uh, yesterday. And um, Normandy Chair for Peace has been created in order to propose and promote a um, message of peace with the future and with future generations and peace with the earth. So concerning Stockholm Plus 50, we, ju we just come back from this event who was held in Oslo, as you know. And uh, it was a commemoration of a very important summit, the very first summit, which put into the center of international politics, the question of the protection of the earth. In 1972, it was the very first time that we saw the picture of the whole planet. And the very first time also that all nations, NGOs also recognized and put the link between the concept of human rights and uh, the environment. Since then, so this conference was a commemoration. We created an institution in order to protect the environment, but we have entered into a new era, which I call the era of transgenerational democracy. Now, the time has come to promote a transgenerational approach of human rights and duties in order to protect future generations. And at the end, all the statements of state uh, during the official, the official plenary session was putting our responsibility towards future generations. And many states also emphasize on the fact that we do have all the scientific information now and do we have also to avoid to commit a crimes against future generations. We have to anticipate to promote environmental law and to protect future generations. Thank you so much. Alan, could you give some of your first impressions of Stockholm Plus 50? I appreciated talking with you and getting first-hand accounts when you're there on the boat at the water level. What was going on in Stockholm and how did you spend your days there? Well, thank you much, Joshua. And uh, yes, it is, as you mentioned, today is the anniversary also of when we abolished nuclear weapons in New Zealand uh, 35 years ago. Um, and uh, that was then the inspiration for us to take the issue of uh, the illegality of nuclear weapons to the International Court of Justice, uh, which was successful. We got a, you know, commit, uh, a, a decision from the International Court of Justice that the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, uh, that nuclear weapons are illegal and there's an obligation to eliminate them. And that's been the inspiration now for this new issue, and this new campaign to take the issue of climate change to the International Court of Justice. So here we have a connection between nuclear disarmament and uh, protecting the planet from the climate. And to me, that was actually symbolic uh, throughout the whole of the Stockholm Plus 50. Here we actually had peace and security uh, organizations coming together with environmental organizations, coming together with human rights organizations, and seeing that all these issues are connected. Uh, peace, uh, the planet, disarmament, climate issues. Um, and this was a, a great coming together, which was important. Just before the Stockholm Plus 50, a CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, released their report on uh, peace for the environment, de demonstrating the connections between uh, environmental crises, conflict. Um, and then also pr just prior to that, there was the Olaf Palmer Center released their report, Common Security, uh, demonstrating how common security, that is resolving our conflicts, not threatening each other with weapons and with war, is the only way we're going to resolve the, these issues. These are all coming together. Um, now, we don't yet have enough action from the governments. And so what we did see is that the final statement from Stockholm Plus 50 was good on principles, but wasn't good on the specifics. 
whereas some of the civil society organizations came through and were much stronger. I was part of the Right Livelihood Laureates Network, and we came with quite strong statements saying it's time to leave fossil fuels in the ground, end the subsidies for fossil fuels, shift military budgets away from $2 trillion for the military every year, shift it into climate um, protection, um, and enhance the rights of nature, earth trusteeship, and the rights of future generations as binding um, on in all legal systems. Uh, so there is a lot of inspiration coming out. There's a lot of cooperation, but there's still a long way to go. We have some really serious crises, the Ukraine war, the, uh, the climate crisis, the oceans crisis. We need to take action along the lines of what civil society was putting forward at Stockholm Plus 50. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, so much. And of course, tomorrow is World Oceans Day. And you really summarize what a lot of people are saying. The Secretary General said, we must place the true value on the environment and go beyond gross domestic product as a measure of human progress and well-being. And really that point was brought up by civil society, and that's where really some of the substance is, where we pointed out that we can't eat coal, we can't drink oil, and we definitely can't breathe gas. So Jewel, what was some of the exciting work that you did, and how are we moving forward to make sure those specifics are then able to make sure that the future of environmental global public policy is rooted in the people and protecting our planet? And um, thank you. That's a really tough question. So I'll go back to the start first. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. I really, uh, it's a great honor to be amongst some of the people who, who've been working with us and advising us and mentoring us throughout this process. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jule. I'm uh, joining from Hamburg in Germany today, and I'm with uh, World Youth for Climate Justice. So that's a youth movement of, of young people, of representatives from different uh, youth civil society organizations all coming together around what, what we've heard a few times already today, the campaign to take uh, climate change and human rights to the International Court of Justice. And so we joined uh, Stockholm Plus 50 as, as young people. We first joined the Youth Assembly, which took place uh, the two days just before the main conference, um, where we could learn from each other, meet young people from all around the world, learn uh, about all the great work they were doing. Um, speak about the the advisory opinion campaign and and get some people involved. Um, and then during the two main day, days of the conference, we tried reaching out to uh, state representatives, to other civil society organizations, um, meet with existing partners. So those who, who've already indicated their support, finally seeing them face to face. That was really great. Um, yeah, and so uh, we are going to the International Court of Justice as a, as a very long journey, but I think the this conference uh, for us was um, a good opportunity to uh, yeah, meet and connect and, and slowly take baby steps towards the right direction. Thank you so much, Yula. It's an honor to spend the time and get to know you here. And David, I know we were both watching from Hawaii, but what's really important as what Alan talked about is we're finally recognizing implementing the right to a clean and healthy and sustainable environment and that perspective of a rights-based approach. Maybe you can share some of the exciting work that you're doing here at University of Hawaii and the exciting work with the Normandy process as well. Sure, thank you, Joshua. It is really a pleasure to, to be here. Eula, I just saw in Glasgow at the climate conference not long ago, and I'm looking forward to seeing Emily and Alan again uh, very soon. Uh, so th there have been tremendous opportunities for us to share some of the information and, and knowledge and work that we've been doing in Hawaii with folks around the world and then also learning from others and bring that with our students and our community. Uh, one of the things that um, we actually were represented at uh, Stockholm Plus 50 by my uh, predecessor, Denise Santolini. Uh, she was there and was one of the folks that had uh, applied for and was accepted, I think only 45 out of 306 applications for official side events at Stockholm Plus 50 were held there. And so the, uh, there was a, a judge's environmental rule of law and a healthy planet was the side event that they held there. And this kind of demonstrating the importance of, of involving judges in that process uh, and how we're implementing the rights that are in place. Like in Hawaii, we have a constitutional right to the healthy environment. And so not every jurisdiction has that. We've got now the Human Rights Council in Geneva last October recognized a human right to the, to the environment as a fundamental right. So there are Lots of efforts to bring uh, local and uh, you know more grassroots based efforts to the international level, and that's something that we've been really excited to be a part of. 
and sharing and providing a conduit for indigenous knowledge to make its way into the, the discussion. And that's something I've been working on with Emily and others at the Normandy Chair for Peace. Uh, even the effort that Eula has, has spoken about, uh, we had hosted at the 2016 World Conservation Con Conference a, a moot court, which is kind of a proof of concept for the effort that Eula is involved in. And of course, you know, Eula and the other youth who are, are very impressive in their own right are taking it in their own direction. And we're just here to provide support uh, for what they're trying to do. And we're really happy to be able to do that. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. And building on what Emily said, what is exciting was the UNEP executive director also quoted saying, further inaction is inexcusable. We know now more than ever that the consequence of marching blithely down the carbon intensive development path is wrong, but we must also know what we must do and let us unleash a paradigm shift for the benefit of future generations. Maybe you can share with us a bit why this ICJ, International Court of Justice Initiative, is so important to fulfill what the executive director was talking about. Uh, is it for me the question, sorry? Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it can, it can be a paradigm shift uh, to do that. I just wanted to emphasize that we have to note on the agenda, September 2023, there will be a future summit uh, next year dedicated especially to the recognition of rights of future generation, the adoption of the declaration on that, the reorganization of institution within the UN in order to promote this long-term thinking. Uh, so this ICG um, campaign is a paradigm shift because it's not contentious case. It can be um, a, a momentum in order to give the opportunity to the highest court to promote the rights of future generations. In 1995, in a dissenting opinion, uh, Judge Viramanti wrote all and opened the way on this action on this which is not a legal action actually uh, but in a sense it provides an opportunity a historic opportunity to protect the future of the future in a non-contentious case what does the international law uh, provides as a matrix and this matrix is to promote and to protect the future of the future so this is will be a leading case uh, and I would like also to emphasize on the fact that the youth, uh, the fact that the, the campaign is led by the youth is also a paradigm shift. As we know, they're all taking the lead. And this is also a tremendous. You muted yourself. OK, Emily, thank you so much. And moving on then with Alan. Alan, of course, you were instrumental in plowing a path forward that was looking at the ICJ as an important venue to make sure that the world is coming together. And we know that in your work, you also did what they agreed to in uh, Stockholm Plus 50 of placing human well being at the center of a healthy planet and prosperity for all. Can you share some of the next steps? And we can also build on what Emily shared about the future summit that will take place at the UN General Assembly. We can get towards that at the end, but what are the next steps with what will take place at the International Court of Justice that is based in The Hague? Yeah, thank you very much, Joshua. I'd just like to add a little bit more though on the importance of this, because there are a number of different initiatives. So people ask, you know, why take a case to the International Court of Justice? Um, and it is, it is vital because we know from science that we have to cut the carbon emissions and protect carbon sinks much faster than we're doing. The governments are coming together and there are some who have good intentions, but they're failing to act because there are other ones who aren't ready to act because of the vested interests in the fossil fuel economy. Um, and they are preventing the action taking forward. So we have to get a legal obligation that is international, that is applicable to everybody. That is not just you know, one country, a you know, national court in, Netherlands or, or, a, or a policy of New Zealand, it has to be universal for us to protect the planet. So that's why we need a, a decision from the International Court of Justice, which will uphold, um, you know, the, what is the, the legal obligation um, and also what are the human rights as aspects here based on science and based on law. Um, how to get to the court? Um, this is not something civil society has direct access to the International Court of Justice. Um, a, it's called an advisory opinion approach, but it's not an opinion of the court. It's a real case. 
Um, and it just distinguishes it from a contentious case, which is where one country takes another country to the court. An advisory opinion is a, a, a type of case in the court where a particular legal question is being asked of a UN body. And in this case, the question is, is being going, taken to the, uh, the, the UN General Assembly. Um, Vanuatu has already announced that they are working on building a number of countries um, and, and working on what the resolution will be and the type of question to ask to the court. They're hoping to get it adopted by the General Assembly resolution by this year, which will be in like October this year. But there's still a hard road to go, because as I mentioned, because of the vested financial interests in the fossil fuel economy, there'll be a lot of kickbacks. That's where a global campaign is going to be very, very important, and where the voices of the youth are so important, because we're talking about actions which are happening today that are having an impact on future generations. You know, we are stealing the future from youth, so having youth voices and youth action on this is so important, uh, but it also needs others. Um, and that's where there's a, a huge coalition now coming in behind this campaign to support. Thank you so much. And it is crucial as we're coming together to build this coalition of civil society, but also nations as well, to strengthen cooperation and solidarity. And Yula, maybe you can share with us how exciting it is to be part of this and what you're working on going forward. Yeah, I appreciate the question about uh, this being exciting. And I think that's what we try to emphasize. There's uh yeah in maybe not enough action happen not maybe there's not enough action happening um and rightly so we criticize that and i think also with an, this advisory opinion we are not trying to point fingers but trying to get the world behind that states behind that civil society organizations behind um the idea of taking yeah bringing climate change and human rights together and considering um future generations as well um it is <laughs> very exciting we have a coalition just a few weeks ago um, with the lead uh, of pacific civil society organizations there's a, a global coalition now of over a thousand and five hundred uh, civil society organizations who came behind this um youth organizations who have endorsed uh this we are in quite a tight uh, timeline so we are hoping that the un general assembly will look at that this year so we will be very busy uh, reaching out to capitals the next few months but at the same time, what's very important for us as a youth movement, even a lot of things that, we, that we've spoken about today are not very accessible to most civil society organizations and most young people. So in this process, we are trying to uh, get people to understand what even is the ICJ most people haven't heard, uh, what is the process, how can get cases, uh, can get cases even to the judges and how can then, what are points of access. So. I find that maybe the most uh, exciting part, seeing when we first tell someone about this, they're quite hesitant, they think this isn't possible, surely we're a little bit too ambitious, and then uh, showing them that uh, because of past initiatives like the one that Ellen was involved in, it is absolutely possible and it's really necessary that we continue this work and that we try to push the impossible, <laughs> uh, seeing how then, yeah, I think the sparkle shows up in their eyes and they think, oh, we can really you know, this can change the course of history. I find I find that very exciting. And uh, I hope to, yeah, I, I enjoy being a part of this and I hope to continue seeing it grow. Okay. Anka Yula, and as we go forward back to David, what is exciting is he's talking about the human rights-based approaches, this access to advocacy. So the International Court of Justice, very important in The Hague. You mentioned earlier the Human Rights Council, recognizing the right to a clean, healthy, safe, sustainable environment is essential. And they also adopted a new special procedure, a special rapporteur on climate change and human rights. And he'll be making his first report to the Human Rights Council later this month. So David, what are some of the other steps that we can look forward to as we overcome these hurdles and organize together to make sure that the rights of future generations are respected? Well, before I go forward, I think I'll just briefly go back a little bit. Eula had acknowledged the, the efforts that Alan was involved in and, and led up to the 1996 advisor opinion on the, the use of nuclear um, weapons. And that was historic. I mean, there are a lot of people that said that that was, you know, a fool's errand. You know, why would you bother doing this? And then, but it led to some very, very crucial importance in the de um, and important developments in environmental law. And I also, the, the, in reference to the Normandy Chair for Peace, the Emeritus Chair of the Normandy Chair for Peace was in attendance at, at Stockholm in 1972, Professor Nicholas Robinson. And he gave a really, really uh, moving speech right after Jeffrey Sachs, 
the renowned economist from Harvard and now at Columbia, you know, told us, you know, gave us the message that's much like what Eula is sharing, you know, those concerns, Nicholas came back and said, hey, we've made tremendous progress over the last 50 years since Stockholm. You know, think about it in terms of the development of laws generally for environmental law to have come as far as it has come in just 50 years is incredible. It may not seem like that to many of the youth who want action to take uh, place more quickly, for, but for those of us who have been uh, on the planet a little bit longer, you know, to, to understand the effort that has been involved that really gives us hope for the future. And so as the youth are working with governments, you know, to have Vanuatu, that commitment, uh, I'll just mention that um, the chair of the Normandy Chair for Peace was invited to speak in Vanuatu uh, back in 2018. He couldn't attend, so I had the pleasure of representing him and met Eula's uh, colleague, Solomon Yeo, uh, a young law student in, from the Solomon Islands who was attending law school in, uh, at the University of the South Pacific in, in, in Vanuatu. And so, you know, they have really, it was really lots of uh, on the ground efforts, including with the Pacific Forum and other initiatives to really move this forward. So a lot of work has gone into this and there's, as Eula recognized, a lot of work still to be done. Uh, and so I, I think it's really, you know, there are a lot of people whose fingerprints are, are on this effort and it's really be mo being molded now by the youth. And so I'm really excited to hear from Eula about, you know, the plans going forward and how Alan and myself and Emily and many other really, really impressive folks who have far more experience with the International Court of Justice than I do. Uh, and I'm really excited to see that impressive pool of people come together and activate you know, what the youth are, are demanding from our, um, our legal institutions and from governments around the world. So it's really exciting to see this uh, take shape. Um, when it was just a germ of an idea, whether it came from Tony Oposa or others before, before Tony Oposa, the, the chair of the Normandy Chair for Peace, it's really to see it happen uh, after you know, frustrations about the slow pace of, of progress uh, in some people's eyes. Now it feels like we're really, when we really must, we're really moving forward in a productive way. So it's very exciting. Oh, thank you so much. And great to bring Tony Oposa into it. I remember meeting him in Bangkok at one of the Sustainable Development Voluntary National Review preparation meetings. And I love his book to get us all thinking in a new way. But also I appreciate your perspective on them coming back and going forward. As indigenous people said at the Carioca Declaration, we're going forward in the footsteps of our ancestors. And I remember getting the first ICJ little booklet, Alan, uh, when I first was starting this human rights journey and the work that I was doing before becoming a professor. And it was, visionary and it's exciting that we're using all the international instruments because we really do have to reinforce and reinvigorate the multilateral system because for too long the world operated in those silos and we're shattering silos just in closing uh what would you want us to focus on going forward in the final moments of the program yeah, I think uh, there is a momentum. Also, something that has been also recalled many times at the Stockholm Conference is that we are facing existential threats. Uh, we're not talking about a social contract, what are you, do you agree on or not? We're talking about and we're dealing about existential uh, threats to humankind and to all living species living on Earth. And this is what I call the, avoiding the tragedy of human rights, and there is a momentum to bring, build bridges between occidental way of thinking with human rights and this transgenerational approach. I'm not talking about intergenerational equity. We are talking about transgenerational rights, which means fundamental rights for our present generation towards the future. And also building bridges with indigenous people uh, who has already this idea of transgenerational responsibility. So I think that to move forward, um, we will do our best to promote the campaign for this year, for September 2022, but as, at least we will meet 2023 at the General Assembly during this uh, future summit and the recognition of human rights for as a um, environmental right as a human right. Um, so I think there is many, many steps coming forward, so keep you posted. Merci beaucoup. Alan, uh, your closing comment. Yeah, just um, how important law actually is 
to help to create a better future. Um, I didn't start, you know, my life as a or career as a lawyer, I was a teacher. Um, and I got involved in anti-nuclear movement because I saw the impact of like the nuclear tests on children and women um, and the threat of nuclear war. Uh, and then I saw how valuable law had been for us in New Zealand. We took France to the International Court of Justice over nuclear tests and it forced France to stop the nuclear testing. Um, we've seen other times when law has been so useful in helping shift you know, the political framework. So don't be scared you know, of joining this campaign of taking climate change to the International Court of Justice if you're not a lawyer or don't know law. Um, it's for everybody. It's, it's a tool for us to use. The court is there for us to use as part of the United Nations, which was formed with the opening phrase, we, the peoples of the world, in order to ensure that, that there won't be war, you know, peace for future generations, um, it's all there. These are our institutions. We can use them. We have to push our governments, and we can do that. Um, and when we succeed, which we will with this case, it's going to be a, a huge shifting point and help to ensure that we do have a sustainable future. Thank you. Now, as we celebrate our 77th anniversary of the UN Charter Day, remind us, we definitely can do that. And Yula, final comment. Yeah, no, a massive thank you for having us. And yeah, please do uh, join us um, either if you're a young person, uh, the youth movement, otherwise the young at heart as an advisor or uh, the, the, the alliance. Yeah, we're very excited to, to do this with all of you. Thank you. And of course, I remember that work, Alan, in the Pacific and Oceania, as we look at what happened in the Marshall Islands and in Morea in Tahiti, we always have seen the Pacific Islanders rising up and demanding justice, pointing out that they're not just drowning, but they're fighting for their rights. And David, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm eager to help connect folks. If there are any youth watching this in Hawaii or el elsewhere, I'd be happy to put them in touch with Eula and her, her folks or, or Emily or Alan. Uh, I think there are, whether if this is too intimidating, there are lots of other ways to, to get involved, right? We've got a bunch of youth in Hawaii just filed a lawsuit against the Department of Transportation. The yes. uh, um, you know, the Fukumitsu family uh, was part of one of our, our panels for the environmental law program. So there are tons of ways for youth to get involved uh, at, at all ages. And that's something that we've been really trying to uh, support is not just law students, but trying to, to provide a vehicle for, for others to get involved. So I'm happy to help facilitate that. That's great. So that's a call for teachers, lawyers, youth, everyone to come together. And we also adopted the fossil fuel free non-proliferation treaty to kind of cover that space from the Paris Agreement. Hawaii was the first state just to adopt that. So there's a lot we can do to recognize our collective responsibility and see that as a cornerstone of sound policy making to protect the Pacific, but our entire planet. Thank you all for joining us today and look forward to going at the future summit, as well as this case at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.